Chicago, 1690 WVON. This is Saturday, March 21st, and of course, we are so pleased to be here with America's Heroes Group. I am the host, Cliff Kelly. Executive producer is Glenda Smith. Our digital media producer is Manny Corazari. March is National Women's History Month. And uh, we are so pleased to be able to talk to some of the folks that uh, are here. America's Heroes Group Roundtable. We serve the world with CBC, Veterans Brain Trust, Think Tank, Ron Armstead, and Dr. Kathy Bennett Santos. And uh, they are both on our live line. And also Rochelle Crump is with us. And we are pleased to do that. Uh, Ron Armstead, veteran visionary founder, executive director of Veteran Brain Trust. How are you, sir? I'm fine, and how are you today? Good. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Uh, we also have Dr. Kathy Bennett Santos, veteran, author, and founder of National Alliance for Women Veterans, Inc. Doctor, how are you? I am doing quite well. Good. Thank you. And, of course, Rochelle Crump, Army veteran founder, president of NWVU, National Women Veterans United. How are you? How you doing? I'm fine. Good. I'm president and accounted for, sir. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, I would miss that. You know what I mean? Listen, <laughs> all we're going to do today, uh, because this is it, you know, March is National Women's History Month. And I, I just, you know, some many, many times we have specific things we're going to talk about. But uh, we'd like to just talk about some women's veteran issues, women veteran issues. Who wants to start off on that? Well, I'll, I'll start. Okay. Uh, I uh, Identify yeah. yourself so we'll know. <laughs> this is Ron Armstead okay. from the Veterans Brain Trust. Okay. I uh, asked uh, Rochelle Trump, Crump to uh, join us because she participated in a woman's forum that we did this past September. And I thought her uh, comments and her perspective was particularly relevant. So I wanted to turn over um, this part of the program to her just to talk about some of the things that she mentioned at the caucus and some of the things that she's working with out here mm -hmm. in Chicago. All right. Who, who is that now, Ron? Who do you want to, to respond? Rochelle. Rochelle. Crump. Okay. I got you. Ro Rochelle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, um, Ron, uh, for that um, opportunity, if you will, to share with you, you know, some of the issues that we know are still very prevalent with our women veterans and the need and unmet needs that are still to be, you know, accomplished by not only the Department of Veterans Affairs, but community programs and um, the things that we have to do to step in, you know, from that small perspective of even our organization. My organization is small. And the things that we do to try to counter some of the things that are not getting done, if you will, so homelessness is still, you know, a big issue, um, and we're seeing more. Actually, this past month, I can say, more um, DV cases, domestic violence cases, and there's not enough housing for women veterans in that area as well. There's not enough housing that fits the income, the affordable uh, income of housing for some of the women that we are actually helping who are in some of the shelters. Uh, one of the shelters that has women in the same proximity in the program, which is like a cookie cutter for if you're homeless, you just go in this pool of homeless people, but they're incarcerated. You know, they've been incarcerated before and, you know, no offense to those who've made a mistake, but definitely, you know, our women who have served this country honorably and who have excelled in so many things in the army who've come out and had a, you know, uh, uh, incident or circumstance that happened with their homes and or family members or domestic situations that they would wind up in a situation on lockdown with people who have been locked down in the um, prisons because of bad behavior. 
So, you know, that's really something really touchy to my heart. Uh, also, the military sexual trauma, those women who are still staggering with getting the benefits that they need to support them for the mental health issues that they have and that it doesn't go away. You know, every day is a challenge for them. We still see that being something that the VA needs to step up and do more instead of, you know, just assuming that because they have these programs that women are comfortable in them, that's all they have. They need to do better with those programs. They need to be more long-term programs of assistance that they're getting, understanding that it gets worse uh, a lot of times when they're not really connected to the right services. They don't necessarily need to be in the VA. They get help in the community. Community partners need to be supported simply because they have a better understanding of what goes on through peer-to-peer support. And then those programs oftentimes just kind of in the VA just kind of reminds them of what they've been through a lot of times. You know, for a long time the VA only had uh, programs that were uh, co-ed, if you will, for groups. And the women just kind of dropped out. They fizzled out. Well, what happened to them? They went to the, um, into silence and they didn't cooperate with going to the VA anymore because that just wasn't something that they felt comfortable doing. You know, that thing in the VA with, you know, the hey baby thing and, you know, the pawning at them and things like that is true. You know, at some distance it is true. Um, you know, a lot of times it's just a thing that veterans think that they're just veterans together and they don't understand, you know, the impact of what happens when they actually approach some women who are a little bit more deep rooted in experiences of, uh, of rape and, and, and harassment that, you know, it's acceptable. So, you know, those That's are some of the true. things our, our organization, the National Women Veterans United, does a lot of peer support mm-hmm. uh, programs where we bring women together and we can share those like experiences. We don't necessarily have that group thing where we're going over what happened to you, why you were in service and things like that. I think it's understood when women want to share that, they do, and they pick who they want to share it with. Uh, we do things like healthy cooking, plant-based healthy cooking, we're doing quilting for uh, cancer survivors, for women who actually are cancer survivors. We've done yoga. We do art therapy. We do wow. financial literacy programs, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And so when they come in and, and we're, you know, driving them to look at their income in terms of, you know, can you start a, a small business, entrepreneurs, things like that, we're supporting that, uh, health initiatives. So, you know, we're doing quite a bit in our center on our own with just uh, yeah. minimum support from mm-hmm. outside. That's great. Uh, that great question, of course, from Ron. Uh, doctor, Dr. Kathy Bennett Santos, uh, please give us your opinion on this. This is a big discussion and we need to hear from you also. Uh, well, first let me just pay tribute to uh, Comrade Crum of Rochelle and her <laughs> Comrade, I love it. <laughs> to her for the great work she's doing over there in Chicago and uh-huh. Women's History Month and just want to show some historical significance to our evolutionary role throughout the military. And I think that today when we are actually uh, providing some self-help groups um, and um, we must be recognized, I think, respectively for... Um, how we are impacted by some decision and policy makers down in Washington, D.C. I think that uh, you are very uh, accurate in your description of what is not being addressed uh, locally. But I think that's synonymous with most, most communities where uh, women veterans will find themselves in uh, many of these same situations you described in Chicago. Uh, I uh, actually had a tribute to women veterans in Philadelphia on last week, and our conversation centered around very similar issues there. And, of course, uh, conversations um, through many major cities, uh, many women veterans communities are experiencing much the same. But I will say to you, uh, Rochelle, that there is hope, I believe. Um, one of the things that I'm finding out in my research um, is that many of the distinctions that we uh, uh, may, be, may present a, a, a compromise to us in addressing our issues is that the various platforms in Washington, D.C. are not necessarily as transparent uh, for 
addressing our individual uh, issues when they come to our municipalities and lo- localities. So they uh, they established policy, and uh, the Congress may may uh, present with a budget for issues that mm. are not necessarily specific to what we are dealing with as a uh, nonprofit leaders and so forth. So I would uh, invite you to share and some of the conversations around some of the uh, advisory committee or the other contributors to the policy where they determine where those budget dollars go, uh, if you can relate to that. So um, that conversation, in my opinion, may not be as uh, exact uh, when you're talking specifically around ethnic specific or the geographics where these issues are, are impacted the most. But certainly I think that uh, in recognizing that as a first step, I would like to also just take a moment to um, uh, thank Mr. Ron Armstead, if I can, here. Uh, Mr. Armstead has been responsive to many of the needs. Uh, and I want to go back just in Women's History Month, which was my plan to talk a little bit about the history. Uh, back in 1988 or so, when he was addressing women veterans uh, and in my, my encounter in 1992, when we were able to go to Congress, and in rereading this particular legislation that mandated women gender-specific facilities in all VA hospitals throughout the country, uh, Mr. Armstead was very instrumental in facilitating that with our congressional leaders. And it was Congresswoman Maxine Waters mm-hmm. uh, who, too, provided testimony in support of that. So I, I think uh, I would invite you to join in our conversation, uh, Rochelle, to revisit uh, its congressional publication 10319. We were actually having a discussion in 1993 before Congress that I talked about these very same issues. You're talking about some 30 years ago nearly, okay? Mm-hmm. So we are revisiting that to have that uh, congressional legislation, which what Mr. Armstead is very humbled and not uh, speaking about that, but I'm going to continue to keep his name out here as being a, a, an impetus for recreating this particular legislation to give an up-to-date uh, to recognize the 21st century state of African-American veterans that uh, was the focus of much of this conversation in Congress. So we can go back to Congress and, and, and redefine women veterans and be specific about where the needs are. And I'd like to invite you to share in that conversation as we move forward uh, toward the caucus and, and, and have a united effort um, for approaching the congressional um, agenda that we have set. Okay. And I certainly appreciate yeah. that offer. Um, you know, I've tried to get on that advisory council and, um, you know, I have all the credentials to do so, but my military, uh, service, I believe was a hindrance to them because I wasn't an officer and that's how I view it. And I did not retire out. Uh, certainly when I looked at some of the bios of those who are on that advisory council, I felt like, you know, I could fit right in with that, you know, having been in that circle for over 30, 40 years that, you know, I had the experience, I've had the basic opportunity to, you know, sit with mayors and the governor in Chicago and basically talk about those issues that are, you know, still ongoing that we're still not addressing, as you so know. So, you know, I certainly welcome that opportunity to be at the table with you. And you know you're one of my one of my mentors. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Well, I, I follow when Mr. Armstead, I think Mr. Armstead in creating the platform for us over the last couple of years um, absolutely has been phenomenal. Uh, when I saw you there, I, I ran up to you immediately and I introduced myself to you, but to see, you know, the connectivity across the country where Mr. Armstead now has uh, galvanized a national platform where we have uh, uh, women who are leading nonprofits out here in our communities. We can speak specifically to what we are experiencing in the lives of these women, being a voice. And I think yes. that uh, that voice has to be present. Uh, so the, the advisory committee uh, is not necessarily the only platform. I think the brain trust will be a very unique uh, uh, channel by which we can focus our attention. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, I'm putting him out there as being our, our uh so what a, All right, what a, watch yourself now. Watch yourself. <laughs> He's an honorary. You have to call well, him an honorary. Now, I wanted to jump in here for just yes, a minute yes, uh, because there were some there were some specific things that uh, Rochelle had said at the caucus that I wanted to go over. 
Uh, Even before the caucus, she brought to my attention that uh, the kind of, can you talk about the kind of community support that your program is getting in Chicago? We don't necessarily get a lot of, let's say, financial support. Let me go start with there. The financial support from Illinois is not happening. Uh, Our support has come from California and from Alabama. And, you know, it's disheartening so many times because we've applied for grants here. We have our own facility. We have the only facility for military women veterans in the state of Illinois. And, um, you know, we do some great work. We know that because, you know, the women are there. They're, our membership now is, you know, uh, at 99. You know, we got 100. We're on the 100 mission. You know, that's just one. That's within our organization. We're not talking about the number of women who we have serviced and or who we have contact with on a regular basis to check in with them when we have programs to make sure that they're included and, and are aware of them. So, you know, it's not that we're getting a lot of support. We get support primarily, you know, for like our business uh, development programs that we're doing. We partner with the Women Business Development Center. Uh, we're getting ready to start a new program with the RAP program from the University of Illinois Chicago for wellness recovery and the action plan for senior citizens. You know, we look forward to that. We have a partnership uh, with uh, a individual that works out of the UIC that does uh, the contracting for us for grants uh, with Pfizer, you know, to talk about arthritis and breast cancer prevention and awareness, you know, but there's nothing direct really, you know, I can say like for financial assistance, and you need financial assistance in order to maintain your facility, uh, the overhead of it, and also to put out uh, for the right now services that we do. We do right now services because we know there are millions of dollars in the community that a lot of times don't even uh, get to the people who really need it. And then the bureaucracy that's behind it that causes women to drop off from the waiting period that goes on for them to even get the assistance through HUD DASH, through other programs primarily that if your lights are out today, you still got to wait through a, a period of time before you can apply for CETA programs, things like that. Well, we're going to turn lights on a day because we have to if you tell us your lights are out. We're going to do everything that we can if you're uh, displaced and you can't get in the shelter. I don't make referrals to shelters. I put them in the hotel until we can find another source of place for them to go. So it's things like that that are monetary that is much so needed, and uh, we continue to um, look at other other avenues for partnerships, and uh, they come small and few. We do have a conversation and a, a relationship with the Department of Veterans Affairs through the Women's Program. Uh, manager, she does everything she can when we get cases that we just can't break through because of the lateness and or the uh, I almost want to say that it's inept sometimes for some of the people who actually get on that case and don't follow through, you know, because we have a lot of that that goes on. So, I'll steer me back to something else that I may have said that because I was on a roll at that day, you know, it caught me right when, you know, my passion is high about this issue. And so you can steer me back if I didn't touch on that. All right. Can I, can yeah, I, the, the, other yeah. thing, the other thing that I remember you talking about was the uh, this whole thing about the suicide line. Yeah, one minute, Could you just uh, retell your experience dealing with the VA suicide line? Yeah, it's been it's been a little while, and I can't say that we haven't had any other uh, major. Um, reports from you I'm, know, a negative I'm, I'm sorry, standpoint. Because I really wanted to, uh, to to get to that. We're going to have you back, but we are just out of time. I want to 